my matplotlib can beat up your matplotlib. Even if you have tools like Seaborn or any of those minor viz packages that you might have pip installed in your corner. I'm Cameron Riddell, and today we're going to create some very modern type charts using my favorite plotting tool. In this session, we're going to create basic and stacked funnel charts, parallelograms, parallel coordinate plots, and waffle charts. But first, Does one data viz beat up another? Well, first off, you're definitely going to need stronger matplotlib muscles. By developing a more thorough understanding of the high level and middle level layers of matplotlib's API, you'll find that you can make absolutely any chart in matplotlib. Do you want to represent data outside of your standard bar charts and line charts? Well, you don't have to wait until some third-party package comes along with tidy functions that expose very opinionated knobs to you. You can create any data visualization that you want now. All it takes is a deeper understanding of matplotlib. Today, we'll cover many of the tricks that I have learned from my own dives into matplotlib's source code and extensive documentation. Let's go ahead and get started. I want to just kick things off with our funnel chart. Now, a funnel chart is used to represent the flow of data from one point through another, typically through a filter, almost always through a filter. And what this means is I can represent data like our marketing funnel for a newsletter. And so we can represent our filter stages as who received the newsletter, who actually opened the newsletter, and who clicked on the newsletter, and finally who purchased, actually made a purchase from our newsletter. And so if we were to represent this just in the most off the bat way, we'll see that we can reach for maybe a bar chart or a horizontal bar chart, and it would look something like this. And you can see that I have my stages here on my y-axis, and the height or the width in this case of each bar is actually representative of how many individuals made it to this stage in our funnel. Now the issue with this chart is it does not represent the flow of data really at all. This just has four different levels on a categorical axis, and it has some numbers associated with them. You cannot interpret from this chart that these categorical values are actually linked and intentionally ordered. Now, the ordering might be a little inherent here, but it's almost impossible to tell that these are all based on the same population. We need something that measures proportion to a whole. And so if we completely disregard the horizontal bar chart and we move to something more akin to a funnel chart, which we'll get to in a moment, we can start developing that intuition and leaving less interpretation up to our end user and communicate more effectively simply through design choices. But in order to do that, I first want to share with you what the heck does a matplotlib axes.bar method actually return? And why do I care? Well, it returns this thing called a bar container that you can see here on the bottom of my screen. And it's an object of four artists. Matplotlib has this uh, notion of containers, and it even has collections, which we'll get into later. But containers, you can think of almost as lists of elements. And so what this is telling me is that I actually have a list of four artists. Now, artists are the thing that are actually drawn onto my screen. And in this case, it's a list of four rectangles because a bar chart is represented just by rectangles. And this is the middle level layer of matplotlib's API. We have rectangles, we have circles, we have all these different shapes that we can do with our plotting. And typically, we add them to our figure, we add them to our axes through these very aptly named messages or methods. And so what I'm going to do with this bar container is just like any container, or any list, any tuple, I'm going to iterate over them. And what I'm going to do when I iterate over them is I'm going to iterate over them in a pairwise fashion or n-wise by two fashion. And so I'm going to be grabbing pairs of two bars at a time. So I'll grab the first and the second bar. I'll grab the second and the third bar. And then finally, the third and the fourth bar. And the reason that I'm doing this is I want to actually draw some linkages, some physical linkages between these bars. And I can use a few marks to represent that. 
In order to link them, I need to get the corners of my rectangles, right? And there is a very conveniently named get corners method, and that returns a NumPy and D array, which I just index and slice just to get the x0, the x1, the y0, and the y1. So the maximum x values and the maximum and minimum y values. I can then link those two bars using this ax.fillbetween method. And very quickly, I'll show you what we're starting at and what we're going towards. So we're actually working with a vertical bar chart now. We have our same four categories that we saw before. I'm going to iterate over this received bar and this open bar as my first pair, and then this open bar and my click bar as my second pair, so on and so forth. And when I use this fill between method, you can actually see that I'm drawing physical linkages from one bar to another. This gives the impression that opened is a subset of received, clicked is a subset of opened, and purchased is a subset of clicked. And now I can, of course, change the width of these bars to anything that I want, anything that's less than one for it to be actually meaningful. And so if I want my bars to be a little bit wider, we can go ahead and apply the same method to achieve the same result. And now I have very fine-grained control over the width of my bar and what the linkages look like. I'll keep this up at 0.4. I think it looked a little bit nicer. But this is the middle level layer of Matplotlib. We can start using artists to do some very, very customized uh, data visualization. And this is the basis for our funnel chart. Now, of course, funnel charts are not vertically oriented. They are horizontally oriented. And so when we're creating our funnel chart, we'll actually need to use our bar H. I don't actually need to use the bar H. I could actually draw rectangles directly onto my axes. This is actually what bar H does for me. And then it returns to me those rectangles. But what I can do instead of using rectangles, I'll just use bar H for now. And the trick here is that I'll need to use this not very often used parameter of my bars this left parameter. Or if you're using vertical bars, this would be the bottom parameter. This offsets the left-hand side or the bottom side of your rectangles that you're plotting such that it respects this uh, left parameter here. So if I want to draw a bar that doesn't start at 0, I would use this left parameter or I would use this bottom parameter. And by specifying this left parameter to be uh, derived from my actual data, I can begin to center align my bars on top of each other. And so let's go ahead and just take a look at that result. And so now you can see, well, I do indeed have horizontal bars and they are center aligned on one another. This has the effect of two things. Well, one, without the actual linkages between these bars, it's kind of useless. And two, my bars are no longer aligned against the same axis. So I now need to make unaligned comparisons, which is actually very hard for us to do. And the reason that we do this is because by deriving these linkages and then annotating our plot accordingly, we can actually communicate or create a visualization that is extremely simple to interpret. And right now, I wouldn't say this is extremely simpler to interpret because I can't tell what the actual height of this bar is. It looks like it goes from negative 800 to positive 800, so maybe 1,600 people purchased. I can't really tell since I can no longer use this x-axis as a measuring stick. Let's go ahead and draw the linkages between our bars just as we did before. And now we start to see that we're really taking this funnel plot to the next level. Now that we have our bars linked, we need to add some annotations because we've lost our, the ability to use our measuring stick or our x-axis in this case, we actually want to rely on text. And in order to draw text at the, or on the positions of these bars, well, I could use the bar container method, the set label method, but I can also just iterate over the bars I can iterate over my data as well. And I can just draw text on the center of my bar at the x and y coordinates on the center. I can center align horizontally and vertically that text. And then one of my favorite tricks, which I'll actually show you in just a moment here, I'm actually able to draw text on the center of my bars. And now you can see that I've this top bar represents the individuals who received my newsletter and then how many people that received it and then so on and so forth. And I no longer really need this x-axis. So if this x-axis is useless, I may as well turn it off. 
But before we get to there, I want to point out dark text does not work for every single color. And I think you'll find that black text on a slightly darkish blue uh, colored background is not the easiest thing to read. And there are small tricks that you can reach for, like path effects on text. What this does is it actually draws a path or a line that spans your text. And this will wrap accordingly to each letter. And so what this is doing is I'm changing the default, the color of my text to white, and then I'm drawing a black line around each of those letters. And what this helps me do is it helps guarantee that my lettering will stand out on virtually any colored background. Even if I had a light background, you would see the black outline, you'd still be able to read those letters. And so there's small tricks like this that we can use in Matplotlib in order to make our plots more legible. Now, let's of course go ahead and turn off that x-axis, and we can do that just by setting our spines to be invisible. And let's fix our y-axis. Our y-axis here is just now redundant with those labels that I have put onto each of these bars. And so I can actually remove the y-axis completely, and instead, what I'll do is I'll convey a little bit more meaningful information. And all this will do is instead of representing or repeating itself, my plot will now show the same data, but in percentages and then percentage differences. And so you can see here that we start off with 100% of my data, and in our transition from our first stage to our second stage, we lose about 10%, almost 10% of that data. And then in our second stage, we're left with 90% of our data. In our transition from our second to our third stage, we lose 30%. And so what this means is this will help us not just visually identify where roadblocks might be in our marketing or our sales pipelines, but this is extremely simple to interpret. I don't even need to use these the bottom axes here. And so a last couple of things that I might do is if I didn't turn the spines off, you can actually see that there's a little bit of white space all around this plot. And so one thing that we can do is we can set our margins to zero, and this will actually tighten up our X and Y uh, data limits to match that, or our X and Y spines to be that of our data limits. And so now you can see I have a nice tight box around my plot, but of course we're gonna turn off those spines and then we'll even turn off our ticks. And I'm going to also move my percentage ticks over to the right-hand side. I don't think they're the main point of this graph, so they're the last thing that I want somebody to read. The last thing I might do is just shift this whole plot a little bit over to the left, but I think you get the point of how we can use some primitive artists in Matplotlib to create a very custom visualization. Now, going on next to our stacked funnel chart, this is a little bit more advanced, but it has the same process and the same underlying features. If we start off with our data, our data here, you can see that instead of just a single marketing funnel, I have multiple. I wanna track my newsletter, I wanna track a social media post or multiple social media posts, and I also wanna track sales from paid advertisements. And you can see here that in my newsletter, well, about 8,000 people are currently signed up for my newsletter. About 20,000 people can be reached by my social media post. Maybe that's how many followers I have. And for a paid advertisement, Maybe the platform that we're advertising on has the reach of about 24,000 people whom the algorithm has decided would fall into my marketing jurisdiction. We can simultaneously track all of these things and present all of this data in a single funnel chart or in a single stacked funnel chart. And so in order to do that, just like last time, I will need to calculate that left-hand position. But now, instead of just calculating the left-hand position on one of my columns or one of my uh, avenues, I need to do it for all of them. Then I'll, of course, iterate over each of these columns and I'll draw their own horizontal bar, specifying that left and then updating that left so that the next time I go to draw, we're drawing on the correct positions. We're not overlapping our horizontal bars. What I do here is I actually store those bar containers, those things that are returned by axes.bar, axes.bar h, I track them. This is, in my opinion, one of the 
best uses of Matplotlib's API. And this is where I see a lot of other higher level APIs on Matplotlib start to fail, is that they only ever give you the axes back if you're lucky. Right? Sometimes they generate an entire figure for you and you're like, hey, I didn't want you to create your own separate figure. I wanted you to plot your plot right here in the bottom left-hand corner of my larger figure. A lot of plotting APIs take away control from the end user. And by exposing the right knobs, aka the artists and the axes levels, and maybe some higher level ordering, things like the grid specs or things like subplots, we can make sure that we maintain control as the user. But I'm going to go ahead and track these uh, bar containers because I want to work with them later. Just like last time, I'm going to iterate over all those bar containers because remember, this is a stacked bar plot. And then you're going to see this same pattern. This is exactly how I created the funnel chart above. Then, or let's take a look at, at how this appears now. We have indeed created a stacked funnel chart. Now we need to go through a little bit of the odds and ends in order to tidy up and make the same annotations that we saw previously. And so what we can do with that, because we've tracked these, all of these rectangles, we can actually iterate over them. And we can, again, draw the text that we wanted to draw on them as we did last time. And so here you see I have some labeling. And I think my y-axis is a little bit more useful. I don't want to repeat audience three times. I don't want to repeat view three times on each of these bars. So I'm going to keep the y-axis as is for now. But what I'm going to do next is I need some way of mapping those colors to the column that they came from. I need to track my advertising. I need to track social media posts. And I need to track my newsletter. The most obvious way of doing that is just by using a legend. And by using a legend, we're relying on the legend default arguments, I need to make sure I'm appropriately specifying my labels. Legends are derived from labels that are attached to artists. And so for these four bars, the first bars that I plot, I'm making the label my scope, aka my social media or my advertising or my newsletter. And then with a simple call to ax.legend, we can add a legend to our chart. You can see in the lower corner of this plot that we have paid advertising, we have social media, and we have newsletter that's green, red, and blue, all corresponds and lines up nicely. But one thing I really dislike in a lot of charts is the reliance of a legend. I need to drop my eyes all the way to the lower corner of this plot, look at paid advertisement, see that it's red, and then I can make sense of the red color that you see on my chart. And I don't like having my end user needing to scan my entire chart in order to make sense of it. I have to do this rapid back and forth motion with my eyes. Instead, what I'm going to do is add some titles above each of the bars and make those titles the same color as the bars that they represent. Now I need to do much less scanning in order to make sense of this chart. There is one very important thing that I want to share with you. And you'll, you didn't notice it before but you'll notice it when I go to tighten up my margins. Maybe I want a little bit of white space around my bars. You can see that the text at the top is now intersected by the spines. And I hope you're thinking, wait, we drew the text onto the axes. Why are they not being respected? Why, why are the axes shrinking past the text? That's because by default, text objects or text artists are not respected in Matplotlib's data space, meaning although they are attached to the axes, they do not contribute with their height to the data of the axes. We can change that, though. In order to change that, we first need to force a draw to our figure. All this does is it actually makes Matplotlib calculate the position of all of those artists, all those elements that I've put onto it. Then from there, my text actually has a width and a height and I can get that width and height from its bounding box or a B box. From there, I need to transform my text from screen units back into data units. And then I can finally update my data limits using those data units from the corners of this transformed bounding box. And you can see once I do that, my text will actually be appropriately aligned. I just need to actually auto scale this will actually be appropriately aligned as part of my data. And I can use those margins, my x and y margins, as you would expect. The next thing I want to share is this, y, this x margin. You'll see on the right-hand side, there's a little bit of a gap. 
but there's no gap on my left-hand side. And the reason for this is that bar plots are a little bit of opinionated in Matplotlib, and I think they should be. Bar plots will always start with the leftmost or the bottommost, depending if it's a horizontal bar or a vertical bar, attached to the spine that it's oriented from. So what we can do is we can actually tell Matplotlib not to use a thing called sticky edges. Matplotlib, when rendering, will go through all of the artists and see if any of them need to be attached to the left hand, the bottom, or the right, or the top of an axis. And we can tell Matplotlib, you know what? Don't do that at all. I want everything to be nice and centered. And so here are our stacked funnel charts really making a lot of progress. The next couple of things are just some aesthetic things. I think the most important part of any plot is getting the function down and then focusing on the form. And so, of course, I will update my uh, ticks here to make sure I'm not putting anything uh, that's redundant. And I'll turn off all my spines except for my less left spine. I actually have a very special plan for that left spine. Right now, it spans the entire height of my axes. And instead, I'm just going to have it span from the topmost to the bottommost tick labels. What I'll do next is I'm going to add a triangle to indicate, to turn the spine actually into an arrow, a pseudo arrow, such that it indicates direction from top to bottom. And what I, how I can do that is I can actually use a scatter plot marker. And I can tell this marker to take the shape of a V or a triangle pointing downwards. And I can even tell this triangle to be drawn even if it uh, occurs outside or appears outside of my axes by turning off the clipping ability. And what we get is actually a nice arrow at the bottom of my spine. And I've turned the spine into its own arrow indicating flow or direction for your eyes to scan this. The last thing I'll do to spruce up this plot is simply, oops, let me import that, is simply add a marker for the units here, right? We don't have, we haven't reached 24.3 people by paid advertisements. We've reached 24.3 thousands, thousands of people. And so I can specify that here as a unit on my y-axis. And this is how I go about making a funnel chart in matplotlib. We have so many knobs that we can turn and we have access to these middle level APIs that give us incredible control over the things that we create in matplotlib. Let's move on to Corellelgrams. Now, a correlogram is used to represent a correlation matrix, matrix of multiple features. One of the most common ways of doing this is just by presenting a correlation matrix as a heat map. But I think we can do a little bit better. And of course, right, we don't want to just say this is a correlation matrix. Maybe we want to add a little bit of narrative here. So ice cream sales are not related to tech stock. You can see here that our ice cream sales and our tech stock barely have a positive correlation, a very weak one, if that, so I would not trust it. So maybe that's a narrative that we can add through our title here. But to make this heat map even better, we can use a little trick called redundant encoding. And I can redundantly encode those magnitudes of the correlations in my plot. Very quickly, I wanna show you what my data look like. This is actually the stacked form of my data. So if I had a two-dimensional data frame, I have stacked this into just a single series. And so we have a lot of repeated values. The reason I do this is because I can actually access part of the multi-index that's returned, and I can get the positions of all of those uh, values. What I can then do with those positions is I can actually draw individual circles at each of those spaces onto a plot. And so my result might look something like this. Instead of having a matrix of squares, I now have a matrix of circles. Now, the figure I showed you before, the heat map is drawn via IM show, which will be way more efficient for large amounts of data. But typically when we're talking about correlograms, we're not talking about millions of data points. We're talking about maybe 100 features by 100 features at most to inspect. And we can definitely draw that with circles here. Now, I haven't redundantly encoded anything. I'm still only relying on color as my sole channel of communicating information. But I can also include this information in the size of the circle. And so now I've encoded the strength of my correlation in both my color and the size of my circle. And there's something very important about these sizes that I want to share with you. These sizes 
need to be square rooted. Or the, the radii I should be square should be square rooted. The reason for that is when I'm looking at these circles, I'm actually comparing their surface area against one another. And if we all know our circle, circular air, surface area of a circle is pi r squared. And so since we're comparing squared values, we want to make sure that when we size these things, we're using their square root values. And so that's just one little tidbit about creating these size, sizes and normalizing them. Of course, I'll set my tick labels like so. And one other thing that I want to share with you is since I have access to all of these circles, I can turn them on or off at will. And I'm using a collection here. So instead of turning each individual circle on or off, I can just set an array that will essentially provide a NAND mask over circles that I don't want to appear. So maybe I don't want to show all of that redundant data that's in both halves of my triangular matrix. I just want to show the lower half. And this is how I would go about showing the lower half of just my data. Maybe since I'm only showing my lower half, I don't want my entire axes to even appear as a square. I just want to show a triangle. And I can actually draw a triangle over top over the top half of my axes here. Then what I can actually do is I can change up my tick parameters just a little bit, and I can provide annotations against these data. And I might not do this for an actual visualization, but just knowing that we can is half the battle. The next thing that I might do is I might use a different color bar. The color bar is just way off to the right. It feels almost far away from the data that it's representing. And so I'll go ahead and I'll remove that. And instead of placing a color bar, I'm letting matplotlib steal space from my axes to place a color bar, maybe I'll place it myself. And by placing it myself, I can actually place a color bar inside of the axes that I've drawn on. And you can see I kind of have this uh, shorter color bar here. But I have direct control over both the height and the width of that color bar. And so you can see I've just tightened it up a little bit. And finally, maybe I want a horizontal color bar that spans the top of my axes. And this is how you can go about creating much denser data visualizations if you are constrained for space. Next up, I just briefly want to touch on parallel coordinates. Parallel coordinates actually aren't that interesting. They conveys the same information as a correlogram or as any visualization of uh, correlation. But typically, this is not built into matplotlib. You can use the pandas plotting API to do this. But you can see here that the more parallel our lines are, the more highly correlated they are. In fact, if you have exactly parallel lines, that means that everything next to adjacent to one another is actually perfectly correlated. So if I only saw parallel lines between temperature and ice cream sales, I would know that those things are perfectly correlated. The more crossing over the, of lines you see, the more negatively correlated everything will be. And in fact, if you get a perfect crossing of every single line, that means you have a correlation of negative 1. And so you can use this type of visualization to display a lot of data. But you're limited by some of the positioning aspects of this. In fact, I can't tell the difference. I can't compare people swimming to tech stock because they're not immediately adjacent. So that's just one shortcoming of the parallel coordinates. I actually prefer the correlogram for most types of visualization. Last up, we have waffle charts. These are used to represent counts of things. And I know you're thinking, well, we can already use bar charts to represent the counts of things. I'm not talking standard charts. I am talking infographic or modern charts here. So for our waffle chart, what we'll actually do is instead of using bars, we'll actually directly represent the count of each of these uh, categories by actually counting squares. And now I know, I hope you're saying, Cameron, those aren't squares, those are rectangles. And that's just because we need to set our aspect on this plot. Now, I've gone through and we've labeled each one of these squares, but we don't know yet what they mean. So of course, I need to add my legend. And you're probably wondering, wow, that's a huge legend. All it says is car just about 80 times. What I need to do is I don't want to plot every single patch and every single label. Since I did label all these squares individually, what I need to do is actually create my own legend manually by tracking the patches, so each rectangle as my key or as my value, and I need to track my unique labels. So now instead of repeatedly adding to my legend, I just add one unique time to my legend, and we get a much 
cleaner legend centered on the top, as you see here. The last thing I might wanna do is actually add a title here, but it's gonna be tricky to add a title because my legend is centered on the top of my plot. I'll see a lot of uh, interference between my title and my legend. A trick that we can use to get around this is using one of my favorite new tricks in Matplotlib, offset from, and you can actually use this in combination with an annotation. And I can say, place my title or place this arbitrary text 30 pixels or 30 points away from my legend in the vertical position. And so here's how I would create a waffle chart in matplotlib. Whew, that was a lot of matplotlib and that does take us to the end of our session today. Thanks everyone. Thank you.